I'm Bram, and today I'd like to chat to you about one of the most enduring folkloric figures ever, Robin Hood, and how it's pretty cool that this pretty radical figure has endured in the public imagination to this day. The figure of Robin Hood first appeared in the 13th or 14th century AD, and stories about him have been told and retold throughout the following centuries. Because of that, the background details of Robin's life shift around a bit, as different bards, writers, and eventually filmmakers have all put their own spin on the character and his world. Sometimes he's had to save Maid Marian, sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's alone, sometimes he's accompanied by the Merry Men, and sometimes one of those Merry Men is a Klingon. I protest, I am not a Merry Man! There is one aspect of Robin Hood, however, that to the contemporary public defines Robin Hood above all else. If I asked anyone on the street to tell me one thing about Robin Hood, they would most likely answer with the iconic phrase, he steals from the rich and gives to the poor. That's weird, right? When you consider that throughout history, the money classes of the world have been the ones who determine what stories get written down and preserved, it is weird that these were among the stories that they chose to preserve. So how did this radical figure manage to survive throughout the centuries? The image of Robin Hood as a champion of the poor standing against oppressive systems emerges fairly early in the character's life. You may know Robin Hood as the Earl of Loxley, unjustly stripped of his lands and titles, but none of that is present in his earliest portrayals. Originally, he was referred to as a Yeoman. Yeoman? Yeoman. That term had different meanings throughout the Middle Ages, but it did always refer to a kind of commoner, not a member of nobility. The earliest surviving written stories also already depict him as being at odds with the unjust sheriff of Nottingham, as well as against the institution of the church. In the first Prince's story from around 1500, Robin spends a lot of time helping a poor knight, and seems to imply that it is general policy to give money to poor travelers. In a 1592 text, his modus operandi of stealing from the rich and giving to the poor is first made explicit. It is told that he does not rob from farmers, peasants, and squires, and it even includes the following lines. He was a good outlaw, and did poor men much good. As you can probably imagine, a lot of scholars interpret these texts as representing a kind of peasant revolt against the exploitative feudal order. Others, however, argue that Robin also embodies a lot of classic medieval virtues, like generosity, piety, and courteousness, and his men are strictly obedient to him. These aspects of the story paint him in a much less subversive light, but in my humble opinion, they don't weigh up to the fact that he is still a champion of the poor, and an outlaw who opposes the most important power structures of the time. I also think it should be noted that these are the stories that are written down and preserved by the gentry, and are therefore likely to be less than perfect translations of the original folk stories. It says a lot that the watered-down, nobility-friendly version of the character still managed to read as subversive in so many ways, so I'm happy to count him as a people's champion against oppressive structures. In the end though, I'm not so much interested in how Robin Hood was originally meant, as much as I'm interested in the fact that the most subversive elements of his character are the ones that managed to survive most strongly into the modern era. Because whether or not his stories were originally meant as a critique of societal power structures, those in power certainly seem to have seen them as a threat throughout history, and have attempted to revise them to be more sympathetic towards them. In the early 16th century, we see the first instances of Robin Hood being a member of the gentry, most influentially in two plays that identify him as Robin, Earl of... Huntingdon. Yeah, the Luxley thing came later. It is also in this century that Robin was first portrayed as loyal to King Richard I. He very quickly went from an anti-establishment champion of the poor, to a figure who wasn't just sympathetic to the nobles in power, but one of them. From that point onward, he often opposed Prince John, not because he was at the head of an exploitative power structure, but because he was a pretender to the throne, a usurper abusing his power while his kind brother Richard was away on the Crusades. The system could no longer be read as inherently bad, it just needed better people at the top. Who wrote this? The Democrats slash Labour Party slash any one of a thousand modern day self described left wing parties? <laughs> In the 18th century, however, a rediscovery of the original medieval Robin Hood took place. The most influential was probably a collection called Robin Hood, a collection of all the ancient poems, songs, and ballads now extant, relative to that celebrated outlaw, published by a man named Joseph Ritson. Very snappy title there to see in a more, it really rolls off the tongue. 
Not only was this compilation influential because it reintroduced many medieval Robin Hood stories to the masses, it was also influential because it popularized Ritson's own interpretation of the stories. He was a supporter of the French Revolution and an admirer of the American revolutionary writer Thomas Paine, and read in Robin Hood a figure that stood up against tyrants in the interests of the common man. And when I say figure, I mean genuine historical figure, which he believed Robin Hood to be, but let's not get into those weeds. Ritson really popularized the foregrounding of the stealing from the rich to give to the poor. You could consider this revisionism to suit his own political ideals, but I happen to think that it's pretty much in line with what Robin Hood stories always represented. Because again, given that the Robin in these stories is already a version that's watered down by the aristocracy, I figure he was always a champion of the common people against unjust systems. Considering all this, it's kinda weird that genuinely leftist movements have not widely adopted Robin Hood as a symbol. There's this enduring and beloved story in our culture of a man who robs the rich to give to the poor, who redistributes the wealth, one may say, and for whom the general public already roots. Under capitalism, as under feudalism, we live in a system that allows an upper class to severely restrict the freedoms of an underclass and steal the fruits of their labor. Only this upper class doesn't justify itself by positing this hierarchy as divinely ordained, but by perpetuating the provably false myth that we live in a meritocracy, which means that those at the top automatically deserve to be there. In reality, the only reason they are allowed to steal the value of other people's labor, while producing nothing themselves, is the fact that they happen to own the tools that others need to actually do the work of creating value. No one has ever earned a billion dollars. The only way to make the obscene kinds of money that the wealthiest people in the world do is to parasitically leech off the efforts of others. A redistribution of the wealth, a little taking from the rich to give to the poor, if you will, would only be a small reclamation of that which was stolen by the rich to begin with. Now, I'm not saying that the character of Robin Hood himself was a communist or an anarchist or even an anti-feudalist in a meaningful sense. He righted some of the individual wrongs enabled by the unjust hierarchy of the feudalist system, but he never fought to replace it with a more just system. It wouldn't take much to turn Robin into a revolutionary, though. He would only need to make his approach a bit more systemic. I'm not the first to make that observation either, because during the McCarthy era, a Republican member of the Indiana Textbook Commission attempted to ban Robin Hood from the curriculum. Those most afraid of communism certainly saw a communist figure in the character. This is why it baffles me that the modern adaptations of Robin Hood don't lean into this aspect of the character more. In a world in which 1% of the world's population owns half of its net wealth, while nearly a third of the world experiences hunger or food insecurity, the core themes of the Robin Hood stories are more relevant than ever. But our more recent Robin Hood stories have been a war movie starring a crusader and essentially a Batman ripoff. Maybe it shouldn't have been a surprise that neither of those really resonated with audiences. So maybe next time someone wants to take Robin Hood into the 21st century, maybe don't do it by bringing riot shields into the Middle Ages, but by pulling from the original medieval themes, and making Robin Hood a champion of the people once more. Hey there! If you like this video, and you want to help me stave off the wrath of the ever-hungry algorithm, you can do so by leaving a like or a comment, or even by subscribing or watching one of my other videos. Much obliged. Help me.